the um, last presentation is Rami uh, Gabriel, who comes from uh, comes from UC Irvine. It's actually a COA prior to medical school. Is that correct? Yeah, so that's right. he was in my clinic refracting patients. I, I, I was shocked, and then I realized he had had all, all this prior ophthalmology experience. So uh, we're grateful to have him come rotate us with us on this month long rotation and turn it over to Rami. Thank you, Dr. Jardine. Um, so I'll be presenting on machine learning and its applicability in OCT and geography. I know Becca Jenser kind of gave a topic similar a while back, so hopefully I won't bore you guys too much. Uh, so the objectives, uh, understand a little bit about machine learning, uh, learn about what Google Brain is doing in ophthalmology, um, learn about OCT and geography and how it works, and then discuss some of my research. Hopefully um, you can use some of these tools in your own research as well. So what is learning besides being avoided by medical students? Um, so machine learning uh, is uh, basically a um, way of ac uh, acquiring knowledge. Um, and you can do it through experience um, or you can do it through study. Machine learning is solely through experience. Um, so there are three main categories of machine learning. You have unsupervised learning. And so that's where you give it data without any uh, answer to the data. So say you give it farm animals and then it groups it by those farm animals, however it kind of finds fit. So it could group it by color instead of the animal itself, like horse, sheep. Um, and then you have supervised learning. And so that's where um, you give it data that has an answer. And so it learns from that data. Um, and then it learns to choose it better. Um, you have two different types now. We're going to be focusing on supervised learning for the majority. Um, there's classification, and so that's um, different categories. And then there's regression, and that's when you um, have more of a linear kind of data, so age, cost, uh, things like that. The bottom one is actually how I first got involved in machine learning. It's reinforcement learning. Um, that's mainly for games and more real-world kind of applications. It, uh, it has a high-level um, goal, and so something like chess, and so AlphaZero from Google beat Stockfish, which is the engine for chess, um, which was amazing. So what is Google doing in ophthalmology? Um, the first, these are two of the major studies. Um, the first one on the top, le uh, top right, uh, top left for you guys, um, is uh, basically looking at 128,000 fundus photos um, and assessing diabetic retinopathy. And it actually did a really good job at whether it, uh, it should be referred or not referred. Um, the sensitivity and specificity um, are both up in the you know, high uh, middle 90s. Um, and actually, uh, it did a really good job predicting the uh, stage of diabetic retinopathy as well. And this is actually FDA approved um, as a uh, referral um, for sending to retina specialists. The second study, um, borrowing from Catherine, should really be called fundus photos more than meets the eye. Um, so it looked at fundus photos and it assessed things that really we didn't expect were um, to be able to be learned from fundus photos. So one of those is age, uh, gender, blood pressure. And so it did a really good job predicting age um, between uh, uh, an age range of five years. Uh, it had 78% accuracy. Um, but as ophthalmologists, uh, you guys know, uh, fundus photos is really just scratching the surface, um, no pun intended. So we have OCT, where we, we can uh, go into the layers of the retina. And specifically, we chose OCT and geography. Um, OCT and geography is similar to other uh, spectrum domain OCTs. Um, it runs the A scans a lot faster. The uh, Heidelberg runs around 40,000, and the Cirrus is around 27,000. Um, and how it works is basically uh, it sends multiple um, uh, 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 scans and light, and then the amplitude coming back is what's measured. Um, for the angiography, the SSADA, which is split spectrum amplitude decorrelation algorithm, basically looks at the change in the amplitude. So tissue that doesn't move should have a constant amplitude, but tissue that's there then not there will have an amplitude that varies. And so the decorrelation is basically one minus correlation. So if the amplitude is all the same, you won't get much of a signal for things moving. But if it's very varied, then you will get something that moves. And so you can see on the far right, on the bottom image, you can see some of the superficial vessels, and you can see the chorio capillaris. Um, and that OCT is amazing. You can get an in vivo histology. And so the, uh, we are looking basically at two capillary plexes in this data, the superficial capillary plexus and the deep capillary plexus, uh, located in the nerve fiber layer and the uh, uh, internuclear layer, respectively. And this is what it looks like um, at, at, at its end product. 
the superficial capillary plexus at the top and then the deep capillary plexus at the bottom right. This is actually from our lupus study. And so the uh, lupus is on the right and then normal is on the left. And you can see some kind of uh, rarefaction in the vessels. All right, so our OCTA data, we had about 1,800 scans. We had um, about 900 patients, and the mean age was 70. Um, but we had quite a, quite a large age range from 8 to 99. And then the majority of our patients were macular degeneration. They were all diseased in the, um, in the prior studies with Google. Most of them also had diabetic retinopathy. So this is just a correlation heat map. You can see if something's highly correlated, um, then you will get um, a, a lighter color. And so these are um, L1 and L2 are just superficial and deep capillary plexus respectively. And then the whole image or the, um, or the uh, hemisphere and separated by different uh, sections of the uh, OCTA image. This is a box plot you can see Age, with age, over 70 and under 70, you can see somewhat of a downtrend. Um, these are all just box plots, so it's not significance here. And then gender, uh, kind of similar, but uh, not as big of a difference. So let's apply our machine learning, and uh, what exactly is it? Um, so we used a multi-layer uh, perceptron algorithm, and so basically what this is is the thing on the far left, those x values are inputs, and so we had 19. The um, different quantitative values from the OCTA. And then the second is the layer. And so you basically assign a weight to all those inputs, and then you assign uh, those weights into the middle node. And so you kind of create this network, and then those weights then go on to the final output. And so that's where kind of neural network came in, is that each one of these is like a neuron. For predicting uh, gender, we did a terrible job. We got 53% accuracy. Um, so we kind of gave up gender pretty quickly. And then for age, we had 74% accuracy, which was actually pretty good. This is a confusion matrix. This is actually what it's called. Um, but it, don't be afraid. Uh, it's actually very similar to what we have with true positive, false positives, and so forth. And so we got the sensitivity and the specificity uh, of our study. This is box plots um, with age, and so basically by decade. And so you can see um, a trend as well in the uh, loss of vessels in the superficial capillary plexus and deep capillary plexus with age. Uh, so after separating it into decades, we then tried a, another classification algorithm. And this time, we got 35.9% separating it by different decades. Um, and so that's a little harder to do. Uh, we had nine different decades uh, options that I could do. So it was still better than chance, but not as good. So we were up against giants here. Um, Google had 67,000 in one of its uh, studies. And then the age range was 40 to 59, so a lot narrower um, and a lot easier to decide. And then the IPAX is actually, um, just a little bit about it, is actually a teleretinal service. And so they service over 300 clinics worldwide. And so it looks at all those images. Their mean absolute error was uh, small. So the mean absolute error is predicted the age, and then it was off by plus or minus three years. And then for us, we were off by plus or minus eight years, which was a lot less than standard deviation, which was about 14. So uh, just to uh, prove that OCT angiography, well, not prove, but uh, show that OCT angiography was probably the best study to use, this is a saliency map. And so where the algorithm that Google used focused its attention. And you can see the age really focused on the vessels. And most ophthalmologists agreed that that green area was kind of focusing on the vessels. All right, so uh, OCT angiography um, actually has been shown in other studies, and it's kind of been debated in the past, but it has been showing a rarefaction in the vessels or a decrease in the vessels almost annually by 0.4%. Um, the reduction in perfusion can, uh, can contribute to other disease entities, and so understanding that is important. Um, for us, our sample size was a limiting factor. I know 1,800 doesn't sound like a limiting factor, but it was. <coughs> And then uh, just using uh, machine learning as an analytical tool, I think, um, can help drive a point. Uh, so I want to end with, uh, this is a quote from Shakespeare, the eyes are the window to your soul. I don't think we've found any evidence for this yet, um, but the growing body shows that perhaps it is the uh, window to your age, gender, blood pressure, maybe even CB <laughs> risk.
Thank you. So there's no question uh, that artificial intelligence slash machine learning is going to be a big part of our future and increasingly being used. Uh, and I think that a lot of physicians kind of fear that area, but there was a very interesting study uh, done in pathology in which uh, it, when you have a whole series of large screenings that artificial intelligence did better than the average pathologist, but uh, what was the best of all is if artificial, and it was dramatically better, picked out the five most atypical areas of every specimen and said, definitely look at these. And so what you do is, is that when, when, when you're trying to pick a, a, a needle out of a haystack, you only have five pieces of hay. That's much easier than if you have thousands of pieces of hay. And when you're screening a lot, you sometimes go into this mode where, where you, you're, you're kind of numbed over, you're not thinking. And, that, and so uh, by, by honing in and just saying these are the places, look, it dramatically improved better than, than any diagnostic criteria. So I think there'll be an interesting symbiosis and a lot of mundane things will be removed and a lot more of serious will be passed on. But there's a lot of stuff that's going to be taken care of. I mean, for most skin lesions, the, the artificial intelligence is already way better than the average dermatologist right. in picking those things out. Right. Uh, but when it comes to actually treating it, I mean, that's, that's where dermatology obviously is going to shine. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I'm not an evangelist for AI. I don't think it's actually going to take over, but combining the two can be quite They would be a very big part of us, no, no question. I mean, I mean, already we're talking about a project now we have in which we're going to use this program because, frankly, for uh, diabetic, one of our biggest problems is they're just not getting screened. Right. And the best time to catch it when they see their primary care physician and the, a picture is taken and AI looks at it and, and it says, you need to be seen. That's where the sensitivity is, what's really strong. Not, not classifying it, but making sure that all those people get it and get in and get seen when, we, when it says that there, there is retinopathy. Because like I said, the sensitivity, as you said, was like 96, 97%. Right. I think those are the kinds of things we'll see extremely important in our future. Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah. yeah when, uh, when the size and quality of the data set is so critical to developing the algorithm, yeah. how, would you, like, how would a small institution compete against like, um, other places that already have the algorithms set up or already have the data set set up? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So I guess one of the things that we did is, I guess we were a little more nimble. Um, so the input variables for Google was 22 million, uh, where ours was 19. So we kind of chose um, OCT and geography because we really thought it was related to age. Um, and so I guess being more nimble and kind of choosing your battles can help. Yeah. Yep. Very good. Thank you. Oh, got another question out here? But Dr. Olson was saying that we see more and more talks on this topic coming up, and uh, there are a lot of us who don't have a background in this as we come up. So right. if you're excited about this topic but want a review of the basics, um, Dr. Fincher, Dr. Petty, and I put out a primer meant for people who have no minimal background in this to give you an idea coming into these talks and what machine learning is and ophthalmology where did you put that primer, or is it? Uh, it's online. It's in uh, Journal of Academic Ophthalmology, but we can also send it out to you know, more than Yeah, yeah, it's not too bad. I actually picked up machine learning um, these past few years, and most of the programming for this was actually done here. So, thank you. Mm -hmm.